Good afternoon and welcome to the CSG Academy webinar on innovation in the automobile industry and its implications for insurance presented in collaboration with the Institute's Griffith Insurance Education Foundation. My name is Sean Sloan. I'm the Director of Transportation and Infrastructure Policy at the Council of State Governments in Lexington, Kentucky. I'm joined by Frank Paul Tomasello, uh, Program Director of the Griffith Foundation. He joins us from suburban Philadelphia. Frank, it's a pleasure to once again work with you and your team. Thank you, Sean. It's always a pleasure to collaborate with you and your team at CSG. At the core of our organization's relationship is a commitment to delivering nonpartisan, non-advocative programming for the benefit of public policymakers. I'm excited to introduce our panel of academics and to delve into today's conversation, but first, let me send it back to you to cover a few logistics regarding today's webinar. Thanks, Frank, and a special thank you to all of the folks attending today's webinar. Should you have a question for our speakers at any time during the presentation, you may type it directly into the GoToWebinar interface on your computer screen. There's a question box on the GoToWebinar taskbar you can use for precisely that purpose. We will collect those here in Lexington and ask as many as time allows. And now back to Frank to introduce our speakers and get us started. The quickening pace of technological advancements is transforming the automobile industry, disrupting traditional insurance models, and by extension, bringing a variety of public policy considerations to the fore. Please join us in welcoming a distinguished panel of academic experts. They will consider the insurance-related questions that stem from advancements in the areas of telematics, peer-to-peer -peer and fleet car sharing, and autonomous vehicles. Each of these innovations, uh, both directly and jointly, present a wide range of new issues for insurance markets, while also presenting some intriguing opportunities. Uh, our panelists today are Dr. Kevin Shaber, lecturer in economics at the University of Pittsburgh. Since completing his PhD at Washington University in St. Louis, his research has focused on the nature of competition and innovation in insurance markets. Dr. Faith Neal, Associate Professor at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, where she teaches undergraduate and graduate level courses in risk management and insurance operations, and also works with executive education and intercultural outreach programs. Also with us today, Dr. Brenda Wells, the Robert F. Byrd Distinguished Professor of Risk Management and Insurance at East Carolina State University, and the Director of the School's Risk Management and Insurance Program. Professors Shaver, Neal, and Wells, we welcome you to the program and thank you for joining us. We'd like to begin today with discussion of telematics as a disruptor of insurance markets, uh, a topic of particular interest to you, Dr. Shaver. And we start with that topic in part because of its promise related to usage-based insurance and in part because it's a technology that is arguably critical to ongoing developments in both car sharing and autonomous vehicles. Uh, we'll explore those two subtopics later in the hour. So let us begin by asking you to help us, if you would, to uh, first understand just what the term telematics means and to provide a sense, if you would, for how telematics relates to the advancements in car sharing and autonomous vehicles that we'll be considering later in the hour. Uh, Dr. Shaver? Great. Thank you, uh, Frank. And uh, let me start by just thanking uh, CSG and the Institute's Griffith Foundation for the opportunity to be here. Uh, and in the spirit of the uh, nonpartisan uh, analysis uh, approach uh, for this talk, I want to be clear that on occasion I'm going to refer to something uh, uh, in a market about making the market better or worse, something along those lines. Uh, I want to be clear that that's being spoke, I'm using those terms in, uh, to denote whether they improve scientific efficiency. So economists deal in terms of efficiency a great deal. Uh, what I'm not meaning is to be making some sort of normative policy statement about how things should be. Uh, but uh, it's usually easier to talk in those terms. So, so uh, please bear that in mind as going forward. So, so yeah, absolutely. Let's start with telematics. Uh, and I've got a basic definition here, just big picture, uh, that telematics is really about accessing, collecting, and utilizing data from a remote location. Uh, so you might think about this, and I'll be talking a lot about auto insurance here and the impact of telematics on auto insurance. So let me start with that as an example. Uh, you might imagine that having access to this to technology where uh, insurers can access information about how one of their insurers is driving, uh, then collect that data, analyze it, and then use it to set rates, how that would you know, potentially alter uh, 
the situation that we've seen traditionally in insurance markets. Uh, now, on top of that, and I'm going to loosely sort of discuss this. Of course, the following presentations will probably talk about these things in more detail. But uh, so we have this sort of direct impact of telematics on insurance for, for instance, auto insurance. But, but if you think about it, this type of technology is also critical for the way uh, car sharing and autonomous vehicles are these industries or these products are either evolving uh, or the opportunities that actually exist in those industries. So uh, you can think about car sharing. That's been something that's been uh, an option, you know, on some level, something that was viable for a long time. But the nature of car sharing and the ability to scale up has changed dramatically, in part because of telematic technology. So uh, then finally, this little flow chart. Basically, what I'm trying to illustrate here is that telematics, yes, it has a direct impact on insurance, but then indirectly through autonomous vehicles, car sharing, and other areas. Uh, we will then see uh, further impacts on insurance markets. So, okay, so on the next slide, if you would. Uh, on the next slide, uh, we can talk a little bit about uh, telematics uh, in auto insurance. I, I mentioned this briefly already, but uh, let's characterize that a little more carefully. Uh, a lot of uh, telematics so far in auto insurance has been this, what we refer to as usage-based insurance, or UBI. Uh, and this is basically uh, insurance companies, uh, when consumers voluntarily opt into a program that collects this information, using this information to set their insurance rates. And this can happen uh, in a variety of ways. Some are really sort of consistent with what's traditionally been done. So for instance, this first bullet point here, uh, improved measurement of rating variables uh, can occur because of the access to better technology. Uh, through or this through better data through this technology. So uh, one thing that's traditionally been known to be an important, uh, a critically important variable really for measuring the risk of an insured is the amount of mileage they drive. Uh, but it's also been notoriously difficult for insurance companies to measure this. Well, now with telematics, it, we can very get get very accurate measurements of the miles driven by individuals. Uh, so that varying variable can be, uh, you know its impact can be magnified on uh, insurance rating. Now, it also, this telematics also creates opportunity for a great number of new variables. So we can measure things like speed. Insurance companies can capture whether someone breaks hard, uh, the times at which they drive. You could imagine that uh, the risk associated with someone driving at 2 a.m. on a Saturday morning is very different from someone driving at 9.30 a.m. 9 on a Sunday morning. So, there are all sorts of possibilities for assessing risk out there uh, using this technology. Uh, so next slide. Uh, on the next slide, I have uh, some information that just focuses on the consumer side of things. We'll talk a little bit more about insurers uh, and society at large later. But uh, I think it's easiest to start by thinking about how does this, you know, this these new tech, how do these new technologies, uh, or what do they mean for consumers? Well, some direct uh, impacts on consumers are the following. One, that we have a reduced uh, likelihood of cross-subsidization between high and low-risk drivers. What I mean by that is that uh, now insurance companies using this technology will be able to identify who poses a high risk uh, and who poses a low risk and separate those individuals out more effectively. And what that means is they can now charge them prices that are commensurate with their individual risks. Uh, in the past, that was oftentimes difficult, and so one price would have to be charged for high and low risk drivers, uh, and thus the cross subsidization. That high risk drivers were paying a lower price uh, because they were being subsidized by low risk drivers. Uh, so this can lead to premium reductions for some drivers, premium increases for others, uh, and some of those premium increases can be hidden because one thing you might expect to see in markets like this is that the people that benefit from these technologies. Uh, in terms of lower premiums, we'll use these programs. But since they're optional, those that don't will decide not to. Uh, and so you would expect to see the pool of risks of the people that aren't using these programs to deteriorate and thus premiums going up for them. Finally, these remaining two bullet points, uh, you certainly can see that insureds may, insureds may find themselves uh, more aware of the expenses from their, uh, their driving. So there may even be real-time updating uh, for them about the risk their driving poses and how that affects their premiums. 
Uh, and as a result of that, it might incentivize drivers to improve the safety of their driving. So on the next slide, uh, I can go through really quickly the basic uh, approaches uh, to measuring these types, this information. So for telematics models, uh, the most common right now, I think, uh, is the first, the dongle. Uh, this is just an insurer-provided device. It's temporary. It's installed by the insured. Uh, it's usually used for, uh, for a short period of time to measure their driving, uh, and then the rates are charged, you know, so may, say maybe a month, and then the, the insurance premiums are then uh, determined based on that snapshot. Uh, so Progressive Snapshot Program, uh, rightly named, uh, is one of this nature. Uh, is an example of this. Now, in, uh, now, that's really used more commonly in the U.S. In Europe, we see a lot more of this black box approach, and these are professionally installed devices. They're permanent. They're more expensive to install, uh, but then they measure data cons consistently over time uh, in a continuous stream, potentially. Uh, where I would expect to see more uh, things moving more in the future in the U.S. Uh, is this combination of embedded and smartphone telematics models. So embedded is just uh, using information or the, the, the uh, capacity that the newer vehicles have already to measure the, the performance of the vehicle. Uh, and so the State Farm's Drive and Safe program uh, is one example of this. Uh, and not, smartphones, well, those are nice because they're standalone. They can be used as standalone devices, especially with older model vehicles. Uh, and then also, uh, but they could be linked with the, the computer uh, in the car itself, and so collecting data through that. Uh, and I also note this as an example for State Farm's uh, uh, Drive Safe and Save, because there's no reason why insurers use one particular approach. In fact, some use multiple approaches. Um, okay, so let's get a sense then uh, on the next slide uh, about how uh, this is being used across the U.S. Actually, uh, Dr. Shaver, let, let's pause here sure. uh, for one moment and, and to remind folks once again, uh, if they have a question for you, uh, they may type it into the GoToWebinar interface at any time. And a, a quick question for you at, uh, and for the panel before we move on, uh, what does uh, the state landscape look like regarding uh, disclosure of these types of, of tracking devices uh, in cases where rental cars may include them? Oh, okay. So. Um, so first of all, yeah, fantastic. I, I, I very much welcome questions. So please, please submit those whenever you have something that you're interested in. Uh, so yeah, rental cars is a, they they pose a different situation, uh, and this is a really nice question because it raises an issue that I, I haven't highlighted too much here, but it's important, which is privacy. And and oftentimes that comes up when we think about uh, companies tracking uh, people's usage of rental cars using these types of technology. Uh, so my understanding is that in, uh, in currently, rental car companies typically just use telematics data to identify uh, the location of vehicles once they after they've been stolen. They're 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 not they're more passive rather than actively used to uh, to monitor the the driving of the the renter. Uh, that said, there are certainly examples. Uh, there was a Wall Street Journal article not that long ago uh, pointing out to a case pointing to a case in Connecticut where a smaller uh, rental car company was uh, measuring the rate at which people drove. And if they crossed over, the, they drove faster than, I believe, 80 miles an hour uh, for five seconds or more, they were charged an additional $150. And this happened every time they did that. So, um, so there are absolutely examples of this type of thing, uh, of, of companies going beyond that. My sense is that companies are, one, worried about how drivers, once if they learn that they're being uh, tracked, how they would respond and whether they would use that company's services. Uh, and then, two, it's still not clear whether it's how, you know, whether they can do that legally. I think that Connecticut case actually was, uh, because it wasn't clearly enough disclosed, uh, was, uh, the firm was required to stop using this practice. So. Uh, I think it's not prominent right now, but it's certainly something down the line that we might need to be thinking about more. And uh, did, did uh, Dr. Neal or Dr. Wells, did, any, did either of you want to chime in here or move on? Well, no, that, that sounds about right to me. Um, I don't know of any disclosures right now in North Carolina that they have to make. 
No, I, I don't either. Great, uh, Dr. Shaver, uh, if you want to continue on uh, with your slide. Uh, that'd be great, thanks. So, excellent question though. So, um, so okay, yeah, quickly going back to the, the current landscape, just to give a sense, now this is a slightly older study, but it's the most comprehensive one that I'm aware of. And uh, I just want to give you a sense of you know, how this technology has penetrated various markets across the U.S. So this study looked at, uh, it's by the NAIC, uh, it, it looked at about 47, I believe 47 state markets. Uh, five markets had no companies using uh, user-based insurance uh, prod products. Uh, Ten of the markets had five insurers or less using these products. There were 15 markets that had between five and 11 insurers. And then only eight markets had 12 plus companies using these types of products. Uh, and then I should note here, nine markets uh, that were, were characterized by the Department of Insurance to not being sure exactly how many firms were using these technologies. So this technology. So uh, one thing that I think that's an important takeaway here is that this is the, the use of this is not uniform. Uh, now it certainly is increasing, uh, but that lack of uniformity can have issues going, that, I'll, that I'll speak to here. Um, so if we can move to the next slide. So a couple of open issues here. With respect to insurers, uh, some things that stand out are, you know, if they're going to adopt these technologies, their costs associated with them. So administrative costs are going to go up. Uh, on the other hand, they get higher accuracy uh, in pricing. And if it isn't uniformly adopted, so if there are other firms out there that aren't using this, they should be uh, gaining competitive advantages. Uh, and so they're going to benefit from this. Uh, and then finally, we should expect to see reduced claims costs. There's data that, that's collected by this technology that could be useful in settling claims. Uh, then a couple big issues for the, the broader community, and I'm just going to hit lightly on this, but uh, you might think about how this technology might incentivize drivers to drive differently. Uh, that might lead to high, greater safety in driving. Uh, it might reduce congestion or alter traffic flows because maybe it's cheaper to drive outside of rush hour time periods. Uh, and it may reduce automobile emissions because you reduce congestion as well. Uh, certainly fraud, insurance fraud could become more difficult uh, given that the insurance company has this direct access to the information from the scene of an accident and so forth. So uh, a fair number of things uh, that certainly could change. Uh, if we could move to the next slide. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about implications for competition. Oh, so Dr. Shaver, uh, Frank Tomasello here at uh, here at Griffith wanted to jump in. Uh, obviously, we welcome, uh, as stated earlier, questions from our audience and wanted to pose one uh, uh, here for your reaction. Um, what role might telematics data collection devices play with respect to personal injury cases? Wondering if you might comment yeah. on that, and then if uh, if your colleagues have any thoughts, uh, we would welcome those as well. That'd be great. So. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess the first thing I would say there is I think there's a, you know, there's a clear connection with, you know, if we're thinking about a person injury case, uh, having access to data is going to be useful. So, you, you know, information the telemax might capture, like the speed of a vehicle, if we're thinking about this in terms of auto insurance, the speed of a vehicle at the time of an accident, uh, whether braking occurred, the location where it occurred, that accident occurred. Uh, the direction uh, that the vehicle was traveling, for instance, how, whether, whether it was accelerating, all this information can be very useful for understanding uh, the context uh, for this case, for a case of, you know, dealing with personal injury. Uh, so you might imagine that this information would be really useful for a liability concern if, that's, if liability is being assessed. Uh, you know, it certainly will generate some facts that might, gen that might be consistent with a particular perspective. Uh, that's at play. Uh, you also might think about no-fault situations where uh, liability is not an issue at all uh, with personal injuries. You still might have uh, useful information coming from telematics dealing with, you know, or informing the potential for severity of injuries, right? So knowing how fast a vehicle was traveling might tell us something about the type of injury, the likelihood that an injury someone sustained is as serious as they might be suggesting. Um, so. Uh, you know, there, there are certainly issues there too, uh, but uh, I think that's a sort of a general sense of how, uh, of a couple ways this might be relevant. Uh, I don't know if any of the other panelists have some suggestions or thoughts on this. Well, I definitely agree that the more data, the better. So many times two uh, different witnesses will say, 
he was speeding, I didn't see them. And I think definitely telematics could inform whether how fast the person was going, how fast they were applying their brakes, that type of thing. And it also could help in fraud issues. So you have these fraud models where the person is perpetuating fraud by swooping in front of a car and then applying their brakes very quickly to try and get somebody to hit them from behind. So I think that telematics can be very helpful in claims and in litigation and certainly in determining liability. Um, in states, you've got two different types of liability schemes. You've got contributory and comparative negligence, and that can have a very big impact if you can actually determine the actual facts of the accident. It might, might I just add that that's a really great point. And one thing that, that reminds me of is that you know, with these technologies, you may only have information from one vehicle. And so in certain settings, it may create an incomplete picture. And that, you know, whether that's neutral in terms of, or, you know, that information is neutral in terms of moving the case forward is, is certainly not clear. But, yeah. Um, here, here is the other problem with that. Uh, I'm not sure if you have touched on this or not. I, if you did, I, I didn't hear it. Um, the insurance company owns the data. The individual does not own the data. So one of the ethical questions that I've come up with on this is, let's suppose there is some telematic data that benefits you in a car accident. Is the insurance company obligated to give it to you, the insured? Mm -hmm. And at this point in time, the, the answer on that from everything I've read is no, because the insurance company owns the data and the insured does not. So there are some interesting issues about data ownership that need to be addressed in this arena as well. Absolutely. I, I'm actually getting to that. So that's, I think that's a really excellent I'm, I'm point. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, sorry. no, no. I think that's fantastic. It's a great place to bring it up because uh, it's absolutely relevant here. That is absolutely right. And I won't say much more. So, so yeah, fantastic. Data is, a, it, you know, who owns it? Uh, and it may not even be the insurance company. It might be a third-party provider uh, that has access. Or it's, maybe they don't own it, but they actually can use the data. So it's not just ownership, but usage of that data that's a big open question. Um, absolutely. Great. Uh, so, Dr. Schaefer, you want to continue now? Sure. Okay. So I'll, I think I've just got two more slides. I'll finish up here real quickly. So, uh, so we'll just want to put this out there so just as sort of a you know just a heads up so what does this mean for competition uh, and the nature of innovation in insurance markets uh, a couple things to think about one is that you know for a market to work well right to be efficient consumers need to be able to choose between the various products uh, that are available uh, but using this information on how people drive may actually make it very difficult for consumers to or increase the difficulty for consumers to compare the prices uh, that different companies might be offering them. So we might want to be thinking about, could, you know, would a market work better if the data is portable and it's owned by the individual, the, the consumer, as opposed to the insurance company? Um, another issue is something I've sort of spoken to already, but this symmetry versus asymmetric, asymmetric versus asymmetric adoption. Uh, and we need to think about, you know, whether competition is strengthened by this technology uh, or not, and uh, how we, you know, whether, you know, how that impacts the performance of markets. And finally, this, this story of innovation. Well, you know, telematics has the potential to really drive uh, very uh, efficiency enhancing innovations uh, in, in insurance products. At the same time, we need to be thinking about, um, uh, about, you know, how much we should encourage this through protecting, you know, developments of new products. Uh, and the diffusion of these products across competitors. So th these are big open questions. So if you could move to the last slide, just really quickly, some big topics for regulation going forward. And the first one is data, uh, which is absolutely, this is, a, this is a huge question is, well, okay, uh, what data actually can be collected? Uh, some states have said, I think California was, was uh, very cautious, has been very cautious about you know, determining the scope of data that can be collected and used. Uh, and whose data is it? These are huge questions. Uh, how will competition change? Well, I've already spoken about this, uh, so I won't say much more on that. Uh, what's the appropriate usage of, of telematics and claims? We've hit on this issue a little bit already uh, with respect to the, the first question. Uh, but so this is, uh, you know, uh, this is certain, or the second question. This is 
certainly an issue that, uh, that we have to think about a little more carefully because it changes the game a little. And these last two bullet points, I think, speak to issues that, that actually are relevant to the broader, uh, to the other topics being discussed today, too. So uh, you know, what we're going to see is that, that with this technology, there's an increased scope of, and precision of the data that can be collected. So how does that change the regulatory role for states? And do we need, do we need new statutes, or can we just interpret the existing statutes uh, to address these changes? And then finally, um, you know, we need to think about these markets are becoming much more complex. Uh, how does that change the resources departments of insurance need uh, going forward to keep up uh, and play, you know, uh, keep their hand on the tiller, so to speak, uh, for insurance markets uh, in their, for their insurance market? So uh, I think that's where I, I should probably stop, uh, but I'm happy to take more questions uh, now or later. Great. Dr. Schaber, we thank you for helping us uh, to better appreciate the promise of telematics and the public policy considerations that this disruptor presents. Uh, we will uh, uh, continue to monitor uh, the question box uh, and uh, ask uh, those at the end of the, at the, end of the uh, webinar today. Uh, as you observed, a rapidly evolving and more complex insurance market has certainly sparked questions about possible changes in resource needs within departments of insurance in each of the states, and telematics is only one of the disruptors prompting rapid evolution. So let's turn our attention now to peer-to-peer -peer and fleet car sharing. Uh, Dr. Faith Neal of UNC Charlotte will lead our discussion. Dr. Neal, perhaps a, a good place to start is to ask you to help us understand the difference between car sharing and ride sharing. You know, the latter concept is one that uh, we're all familiar with uh, within the context of Uber and Lyft and, and uh, some of these other companies. And it's uh, a topic that uh, Frank and I have, have hosted more than, than one webinar on. Uh, but help us to understand the difference between ride sharing and car sharing. Yes, thank you. Ride sharing, the, different, the big difference between ride sharing and car sharing is who's driving the car. With ride sharing, the owner of the vehicle is driving the car. And with car sharing, the owner of the vehicle is lending out their car to be driven by someone else. So the problem that arises there is any time you separate the financial interest in an asset with the person actually using the asset, then you have to be a little bit more careful about how you uh, qualify the people using that. So the main difference is actually who's driving the car. So I will continue on and with the presentation. Car sharing is basically co collaborative consumption. And what it is doing is it is making idle vehicles available to consumers for short-term access to vehicles. It is actually able to reduce the need for personal vehicle ownership. So in certain areas of the country, particularly urban areas and college campuses, it is enabling people to actually go without purchasing their own car. So um, they take idle cars, they can log onto an app, and then they can reserve this car, go get it, use it, and then return it. So please go to the next slide. There are three main models of uh, car sharing. The first is business to consumer. Business to consumer is where the company itself has a large fleet of vehicles that they make available. Um, it can be location-based or free-floating. Business to consumers are, they actually consist of three categories. You've got auto manufacturers that do this, such as BMW and Pugo. Then you have actual rental companies, traditional rental companies that are actually doing car sharing as well, Hertz. And then you've got car sharing brands, so companies that were uh, developed simply to do the car sharing, like Zipcar and GoGet. The second model is peer-to-peer, -peer, and the peer-to-peer -peer is where individual car owners are renting their personal vehicle. So the interesting thing about this is research shows that the average vehicle is only used about an hour a day. So that's 23 hours in a day that your car is sitting idle, and we put a tremendous amount of money into our vehicle. So in the peer-to-peer, -peer, a person can drive their vehicle to work maybe park it at 8 o'clock in the morning. They may not need it till 5. They can make it available. Somebody else can come pick it up, use it during that time frame, and then return it. And then the last model is not-for-profit, and these are local organizations such as cities and municipalities that are facilitating car sharing. 
So we've seen this in Philadelphia. Philadelphia has a car share and Chicago has iGo. Next slide, please. So um, here's an example, and this is from Zipcar, of how it works. Basically, a person wants to become a member. The thing about joining a car share is that it's, it's fairly cheap, at least right now. The membership to affiliate with the company is about $7 a month and $70 a year. And then they have to rent the car, and it costs about $8 to $10 an hour. And this is really convenient for people that only need a car for you know an hour, two hours. Sometimes they only need a car for 15 or 30 minutes. So how it works is they join, they apply online to join this membership, and it's approved. Zipcar does a background check and all that. Once it's approved, they'll send a zip card to the member. Then when the member is ready to use a car, they log on. They find a car near them, they reserve it. They can reserve it for as little as one hour, as long as seven days with the zip car. When it's time to use the car, they go locate the car, they unlock the car using the zip card, and then the keys are in the car. So they can get the keys, they drive it around. If they end up needing it longer than they originally thought, they can extend it using text or using the mobile app. And then they just return the car to the designated spot. They lock it up with the app or with the zip card, and then they're done. So next slide, please. As you can see, uh, I've provided data from 2000 to 2010. Growth has been tremendous in the past years. Interestingly, though, as of July 2015, um, there are now 1.17 million members of business-to-consumer members. Um, this is only business-to-consumer members. The data was not available for peer-to-peer. -peer. So between 2010 and 2015, that orange line has even doubled. So growth has been tremendous. Next slide, please. Why do people want to do car sharing? Well, for the owner, they can make some decent money doing it. The research shows that the average car costs $715 a month. Well, it's been estimated they can earn $600 to $1,000 a month with that. So they can basically at least pay for the car, for the maintenance and insurance and that type of thing. Um, once again, the consumers like it because they may not have to buy a car. If there's a lot of participation in their area, they can just go without a car and use this car sharing and just use it when they need it instead of having to pay for a car to be available all the time. They can incur tremendous cost savings. It also can be very convenient to use, granted if you're in the right location, and there's guaranteed parking. Environmentalists really like it because, of course, there's less cars on the road. There have been estimates. Now, these estimates vary, but in general, there have been estimates that for every rented car, there are 15 less owned vehicles on the road. Um, car sharing members drive 31% less than when they own the personal vehicle. So this is, has some really good environmental impact. Next slide. There are some challenges with car sharing. Uh, I'm going to talk about three. One is insurance, regulations, and infrastructure. Next slide. As far as insurance goes, they need to talk about, um, next slide. Uh, P Professor Neal of Frank Tomasello at Griffith, we want to do uh, uh, to jump in for just a minute and remind listeners again to submit their questions if they have them through the Go To Webinar Taskbar. Um, and uh, before we move on, uh, thought we'd take a moment to pose a quick question for you that we have here. Uh, in instances of peer-to-peer of -peer car sharing, uh, we have a question for you. Uh, one asks, will car owners' personal insurance policies cover their cars if they are rented out, so to speak, to other drivers? Uh, and and uh, sort of in tandem with that question, uh, one wonders, can policymakers perhaps leverage learnings and approaches that have been used to address ride-sharing challenges, perhaps to meet questions related to car sharing? So we wonder if you might uh, comment uh, uh, on those questions for a moment or two, and uh, if uh, co-panelists care to opine as well, we'd, we'd welcome that also. So in general, the answer to your first question is no, and the answer to the second question is yes. So no, your personal auto policy is not going to apply when your car is being rented out. If, if, but there's always caveats. And number two, yes, um, 
the they can certainly learn from the uh, the ride sharing to inform how to structure the insurance coverage. And I actually a little bit later I talk about some of the insurance coverage, so I think that'll that'll be a nice lead in. Um, so does any of the other two? Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I don't. I don't really have much to add other than uh, be curious, and I don't actually know the answer to this, but whether uh, uh, you know this might be uh, something that drives more fraud. That you know, someone loans their car out, and the person gets into an accident. Um, if they're not covered, um, you know, do they uh, do they try to claim they were the driver in order to get coverage for that? Yes, and and that's. I think that's where your telematics can come in to help as well. Absolutely, possibly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you both. Uh, Dr. Wells, any comments from you on those uh, questions or, or anything else at this stage? No, not, not, not at this point. Well, thank you very much. Okay, we'll we'll so, uh, turn things back to you, Dr. Neal. Okay, so hopefully this next session will help a little bit answer more questions on the personal auto policy side of it. But what are some of the challenges when you start thinking about insurance coverage, especially for peer-to-peer, uh, is it a commercial coverage or should it be a personal coverage? Should they have a, uni a unique policy to cover it or should they just add an endorsement onto the personal auto policy or the PAP? Should they provide basic or primary coverage or should there be an excess limit? These are some of the things that they have, they have talked about and they need to uh, think about. So next slide. I'm going to talk first about the fleet coverage because the fleet coverage is, is probably the easiest. It's very similar to the traditional rental company, so insurers really don't have much trouble tr writing uh, policies for fleet because it is so similar. The only difference is traditionally when a person goes to rent a vehicle from a traditional rental company, they'll probably have their own personal auto policy that can cover that car as it drives around. Um, however, under car sharing, the per person may not have an auto policy. I mean, that's the whole purpose, was not to own their own auto. However, renters who do not own their own car uh, should probably buy a non-owned auto policy to cover them for liability while they have that car. The fleet company will buy a comprehensive policy, and the thing about the fleet company also is they can utilize the loss control. So they'll have a much more robust loss control measures as far as when the tires need changing, they can change the tires. If the brake pads get worn out, they can change that. So they have a much more robust risk management they can turn to. Next slide. With the peer-to-peer -peer coverage, what we need to think about is the owner may have significant risk retention. So number one, they're relying on the peer-to-peer -peer provider to qualify the renters. And really this is where and to retain your qualification, this is where that telematics can become key. So what if you have a renter that initially qualified and then they, they have very erratic driving patterns. That will be picked up through the telematics, which can be very, very helpful to both the peer-to-peer -peer company and also the car share owner. But they will still have significant risk retention. They may incur unexpected liability from the accident by the renter. So the renter has rented this vehicle um, and they're in an accident. There has been a case where the a, a, a renter had an accident, injured four people, and the four people sued the renter, the car owner, and the peer-to-peer -peer company. So the uh, car owner does need to make sure that they have coverage for themselves when somebody has rented that car. And they can get coverage under a personal auto policy, but they have got to let the insurance company know, and there has to be specific coverage for that. Um, so we've got unexpected liability from the accident by the renter. Um, the other panelist was talking about some fraud that could occur. And you know, there's going to be quite a few things that can occur that is very difficult to predict or even think about. And most certainly, there's going to be stuff that occur that there's no judicial precedent for. And then, of course, the owner of that vehicle is going to have other liability such as failure to maintain the vehicle. So if they're not maintaining the vehicle and then somebody's in an accident because of breakdown of the vehicle, that could be a problem. So next slide. So 
So the issues with the personal auto coverage or the PAP is generally these personal auto policies exclude coverage for livery or conveyance. These personal auto policies are not meant to cover taxi services. They are meant to cover personal auto, personal auto use, which when you, as we know, on average a car is used one hour a day. But once you start using it for car sharing, it may be used quite a bit more a day. Then the problem arises about who's the driver. The owner driving a vehicle is, has a much different risk than somebody else driving a vehicle. When an insurance company underwrites an auto policy, they're also determining the risk profile of the owner driver of the vehicle. When you put an unknown person into that vehicle, you don't know that driver's risk profile, so the insurance company will have a hard time from determining that. But then that driver is coming into this vehicle. They may be unfamiliar with the car. They may not know how some of the things work. And they may be unfamiliar with the area in which they're driving, maybe different signage, different traffic patterns, things like that. Another issue with personal auto coverage is who's liable. In an accident, who's liable? Is it the app application, the peer-to-peer -peer provider? Is it the car owner or is it the car renter? When did the accident happen? Well, again, telematics could be very crucial here. Who was in control of the car when the accident happened? Was it the owner? Was it the renter or was it in transition? If a renter rents a vehicle and they damage it, who's responsible to damage, for the damage? Is it the renter or the car owner? And so these are some of the things that they have to consider. Next slide, please. Here's an example of how Toro.com handles it. They are a peer-to-peer -peer provider. They have actually partnered with um, three insurers, Intact Insurer, Bel Air Direct, and Capital General Insurance to offer both commercial and personal auto coverage for owners that are making their cars available. The commercial side of the coverage covers during delivery and rental, and it provides physical damage, collision, comprehensive, and theft coverage. But it also provides $1 million in liability insurance if the accident occurs during delivery or rental. And that, that's actually very good because in some states we have very low auto liability limits. They can be as low as $10,000 in some states, $15,000, which is not very much limits at all. So with this, they get $1 million worth of liability coverage if it's being um, used by a, a renter at the time. At all other times, other than delivery or rental, the owner is protected by their own personal auto policy. However, the owner must let the insurer know that the car is being used for car sharing. Next slide. And so we, want to, uh, some, oh. we want to interject another uh, question here for Dr. Neal and, and the panel here and remind folks to uh, send in theirs via the GoToWebinar pass bar. Uh, Dr. Neal, what can be learned from states that have begun to address uh, car sharing related insurance questions through either legislation or regulation? Well, they can learn uh, basically how to address insurance and how to address certain different types of regulation. And one of the big issues has also arisen is taxing, taxation. So um, what has happened is initially these car sharing instances have been taxed like traditional rental companies. So even if a person is renting a car for 15 minutes or 30 minutes, they're being taxed like they have rented a car for a day or two. And so in some cases, this has actually made, um, made the, the, it become un, unaffordable, or not necessarily unaffordable, but, but not cost effective for it to be used. So there are some states that are lowering the tax is to be more commensurate with the actual usage amount of time. Um, so they could learn from that. Um, there are some other regulations I'll talk about. If you could go to the next slide, please. Unless, wait, if the other panelists want to add anything. Otherwise, I can move on. I have nothing to add. OK. Me either. OK, so this is just a snapshot of a, of a few states that have done some stuff. There's certainly a lot more out there. Um, I've gotten the source at the bottom if you want to go look at some of this. But both Wisconsin and California have passed some regulations defining what car sharing is and also outlining um, parking in 
different areas and localities. So one of the things that's pretty crucial to car sharing is that there, there's designated parking spots, and those have to be provided by the municipalities. Um, so Wisconsin, California have been addressing that. Um, California, Oregon, and Washington have enacted laws to clarify how peer-to-peer -peer car sharing works. As far as insurance, what they have passed is that an insurance company cannot cancel um, an insured or refuse j just because they're car sharing. Now, the insured has to uh, let them know about that and advise them of that, but they can't use that as a factor to discount them from insurance. And then they've also uh, talked about some other regulatory frameworks for peer-to-peer. -peer. Okay, next slide. Some states have gone into partnerships. Oregon has partnered with Amtrak, Cascades, and Zipcar, so people can ride the train and at the train station have access to the Zipcar. Dallas, LA, and Atlanta have partnered with car sharing organizations to supplement their public transportation. And Massachusetts Department of Transportation has actually partnered with Zipcar to provide car sharing for state employees. Um, this is my next slide is really my last slide, and it's Another concern is infrastructure. Again, car sharing is dependent on having uh, parking spaces. So I've put a source down at the bottom with uh, research on parking. It really covers a lot about parking, but it talks about allocation. Where should this allocation be? Um, another thing you have to decide is how many parking spaces are you going to provide in certain areas? What kind of fees are you going to require and permits? If you're making these city spaces available for these cars, then you need to recoup that fees that you would have gotten otherwise. What kind of signage is required? How will they enforce it? And of course, they talk about you need to have the public involved in these matters as well. So my last slide is actually just some references if you would like to read further about this. Um, some good, some good uh, references that I found. And that concludes my presentation unless uh, somebody has some questions. Dr. Deal, thank you very much for your insights into car sharing and its impact on insurance markets, uh, along with your sense for public policy questions that have come into play. Uh, an intriguing topic, to be sure. Uh, as the landscape for car sharing evolves, so too will the public policy considerations. And uh, on the topic of evolution, let's shift gears, if you'll pardon the pun, uh, and uh, turn our attention to autonomous vehicles. Uh, technology that has advanced rapidly and the age of autonomous vehicles is really just around the next turn. Sorry, couldn't resist another pun, uh, but it's uh, <laughs> it's a pleasure to have Dr. Brenda Wells of East Carolina University on hand to share her expertise. Uh, Dr. Wells, only a few years ago, the prospect of autonomous vehicles was thought by many to be the stuff of science fiction, a futuristic dream. But things have evolved, have evolved and uh, I thought a good place to start would be to have the, help us, if you would, to understand where things stand today with respect to this market disruptor of autonomous vehicles. Thank you, Frank. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for having me, Sean. Uh, autonomous vehicles are a rapidly evolving technology. Um, basically, the, the more common name for them is a self-driving car. And what we find today is that many cars on the market offer some self-driving features. If you'll switch to the next slide, please. There is uh, the National Highway Transportation Safety Authority has a um, classification scheme for autonomous vehicles where a level zero is what most of us are used to, where the driver controls the vehicle at all times. A level four vehicle is one in which the vehicle would control all functions from start to stop, including parking. Uh, it could even be an unoccupied car that's self-driving. What we have on our market today are largely level one and level two vehicles. Uh, in which certain things are automated in the vehicle, but it still requires a driver's constant attention. Now, when you get to level three, it's when it starts to look more like a self-driving car. The driver can, in a level three, fully seat control to the car, 
But in most of those situations, the driver should still maintain control or be prepared, I should say, to take over control and be prepared to take back over the driving function. Next slide, please. Now, there's a range of self-driving car features out there right now. There are no level four fully automated self-driving cars available to the public. Uh, but the car, oh, why are we trying to do this? I, I mean, that's the real question is it, because, you know, if I talk to people, especially like my father's generation, he's in his 80s, and he's just like, I don't want a car like that. I would never want to not drive. But there are a lot of people out there who do think these cars are very beneficial to society. And from an insurance perspective, we see a lot of benefits. Uh, if you take away 93% of auto accidents are due to human error. And if you take away human error, you just reduced your auto accident 93%. Um, and, and I want you to think about this statistic, which I think is very interesting. The 747 airplane came out in 1970. In 49 years, it has been responsible for a little over 3,000 deaths in terms of crash deaths. So in almost 50 years, the 747 has killed a little over 3,000 people. Automobiles in this country kill 35,000 people every year. That is the equivalent of a 747 crashing every week for 52 weeks a year and killing everybody on board. So whereas in the past, our car manufacturers have focused on crash survival, and making the cars safer for the occupants, we are now turning our attention to reducing accident frequency and trying to prevent these unnecessary deaths. So if that is one of the huge drivers behind this technology is if just were to take out the human component of driving, we would have fewer car accidents. We would not have to worry about driver impairment whether that's young age, inexperienced driving, people who are intoxicated, people who have medical conditions, people who are texting, people who are putting on makeup, who are eating, all of those things would, would go away if the car took over the driving function. This would in turn, if we're reducing our accidents, we would need less auto insurance and we would even have reduced car theft because the car would be self-aware enough to know who should be in it and who should not. Next slide, please. Now, there are some safety challenges here, and, and I could spend an hour just talking about the benefits and the safety challenges, so I'm just scratching the surface. Um, one of those is the software's reliability and vulnerability to hacking, jamming, and other interference. And, you know, we really don't know how reliable the technology is because it hasn't been tested on a widespread basis. Another problem with these types of vehicles is you take a 16-year-old, you get them in a self-driving car or a primarily self-driving car, and you let them enjoy the benefits of a car that avoids accidents and does things on its own. When they enter into a complex driving situation that requires them to take over manually, they have less driving experience than someone who drove manually the whole time, and they're not going to be able to manage those situations as effectively as someone with a lot of driving practice. Another question that comes up is, are they really safe? And that is the question I think that bothers most people, is, is this technology really safe? Next slide, please. Google has been the pioneer in the United States on self-driving vehicles. And they have several test vehicles out. They have driven millions of miles in them. And to date, they have had 14 accidents 
If you look at this list on the slide, I won't read it to you, only one of those was the car's fault. The car attempted to avoid sandbags and struck a bus. The other 13 accidents were human error. Uh, another driver ran a stop sign. An employee was driving the car manually. So the reality is these cars, so far, the safety records on them are actually pretty good. Next slide, please. Now, what comes to mind for a lot of people right now is Tesla. And a lot of people heard about in May 2016 about the fatal accident involving the Tesla self-driving vehicle in an 18-wheeler in the United States down in Florida. Now, you'll see the way my slide is organized. It says, according to Tesla. Well, there's a story to tell here, and it depends on who you're asking how that story goes. According to Tesla, the autopilot and the driver did not see the white side of a tractor trailer against a brightly lit sky, so the brake was not applied. The car drove under the 18-wheeler, killing the driver. And that was Tesla's first known autopilot death in over 130 million autopilot miles driven. Uh, there's a fatality every 94 million miles uh, among manually driven vehicles in general, so that's still a pretty good accident rate. Tesla also says you cannot play movies on that car's screen. The truck driver that the car ran under the truck, the driver of that truck got out and was the first one on the scene. Uh, he reported that the driver was playing a movie in his car, uh, specifically Harry Potter. And the highway patrol pointed out that there was an aftermarket DVD player installed in the car. Next slide, please. Now, NHTSA cleared Tesla of any wrongdoing just a few months ago by pointing out that the Tesla was never intended to be used hands-free. The Tesla required full driver engagement at all times. The computer showed that the driver set the, the cruise control at 74 miles per hour two minutes before the crash, and based on distance and visibility that day, the driver should have had at least seven seconds to see the truck and take action. So the conclusion is, and, and the, the, the gentleman um, who died in this accident was also known to have made videos of himself and posting them on YouTube or in other social media venues saying, look, I'm, not, I'm driving my car without my hand. And he was very much into apparently giving control of the car to the car and not monitoring the driving behavior of the car. So Tesla was cleared in this accident uh, of having any blame. Next slide, please. As we go back to the NHTSA classification levels, the Tesla is between level two and level three, which experts in autonomous vehicles say is the most dangerous type of vehicle out there in terms of autonomous vehicles because this, this is where people get lazy. This is where people get sloppy. This is where people plug in Harry Potter and watch the movie when they're still supposed to be focusing on the road. And so there are experts who agree that, you know, it's safer to either have a level zero car where the driver knows they have to do everything or a level four car where the driver knows they have to do nothing. But giving the driver some ability to yield functions to the car and some ability to manually drive the car is probably the most dangerous type of autonomous vehicle that there is on the market. Um, next slide, please. Now, there are several other limitations of these vehicles. First of all, the technology is not smart enough to predict what another driver will do. Now, there is something called vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication technology, and, and that is becoming rapidly available and is expected to reduce accident frequency a considerable amount. It, it basically involves each car signaling the cars around it. 
hey, I'm about to stop. Hey, I'm about to take off. Hey, there's a pothole up ahead. There are lots of things that this vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle signaling can do, but until that is in play, the bottom line is you can have a self-driving car, but it cannot tell you what the guy in front of you or the guy behind you or the guy beside you is going to do. Another thing that's making these cars a little iffy is that the sensors in them get confused when rain and snow make the lines on the roads hard to see. Uh, those can be very troubling um, conditions and very challenging conditions to operate an autom autonomous vehicle in. Potholes. Uh, you wouldn't think that potholes would be that tough to deal with. But from the car's perspective, from the car's radar and LIDAR vision, uh, is it a pothole? Is it an oil slick? Is it a shadow on the road? We don't know what it is. And that can also throw off the navigation system. Um, finally, and to me, this is by far and away the most interesting thing about these vehicles is how do we program them? to make difficult decisions. Let's suppose you've got an autonomous vehicle going down the street and it has a, a brick wall on the left and out on the right side of the road comes a ball, a bouncing ball, followed by three toddlers chasing it. Now, what should the car do? Should the car protect the toddlers outside the vehicle? Or should it protect the driver inside the vehicle from hitting the brick wall? Which safety priority is mo more important, protecting the driver or those outside the vehicle? These are very challenging ethical decisions that have to be programmed into a car that you, know, you will find a lot of divergent theories on what should and shouldn't be done. Next slide. So from an insurance perspective, if we take driver behavior out of the accident equation, then we're not really going to need that much personal auto liability insurance anymore. Uh, claims for accidents are going to be based on the software that runs the car, the hardware that runs the car, and not driver error. So what we anticipate happening is that the personal and commercial auto insurance markets will shrink as these vehicles become more prevalent. The personal line, the, I'm sorry, the auto insurance market in this country is the largest insurance segment of any. It's a $170 billion market. And you take away a lot of that responsibility for driving and you take away that insurance, that's a huge segment of the insurance market that's going to disappear. When accidents do occur, how do we determine fault and who will be at fault? Is it the person that made the, or the people, the company that made the car? Is it whoever made the software? Is it whoever made the mapping platform? Maybe it's another car that has vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle technology that sent a faulty signal to the cars around it. And so the forensics of, of, of tearing apart an auto accident and figuring out who's at fault are going to be very challenging and very interesting. Next slide. And Dr. Wells, uh, we, uh, I know you're going to take us through the, uh, the labor market implications uh, as your last slide. Uh, we, we wanted to pause here. Uh, and uh, it looks like we're not going to have uh, time for, for questions uh, at the end uh, here, but uh, um, we will let you go through that, that next slide in the interest of time and, uh, and then Great. call it a day. Thank you, Sean. One of the things that it isn't directly insurance related, but it's important, is to realize what this disruptor is going to do to the labor market. Because when you take traffic errors out of driving, you are going to have fewer traffic citations, which is going to mean less government revenue, less need for traffic patrol officers, more people out of work. You're going to have fewer insurance claims, which means you need fewer claims adjusters. With less claims, you're going to have less revenue for body shops, chiropractors, emergency rooms, and attorneys. And not pictured on this slide is the simple implication that if you can make a self-driving 18-wheeler, 
you're going to put two and a half million professional 18-wheeler drivers in this country out of work. And the question becomes then, what do those people do for a living? And no one has answered that question yet. And it brings up a very simple issue, and that is, you know, autonomous vehicles, just because we can do it in terms of how many people it may put out of work, the question is, should we do it? And I, again, this is a nonpartisan presentation, so I don't have an answer for that. But it does bring up a lot of very interesting questions. Great. Uh, well, we are just about out of time for, for today's webinar. Professors Shaver, Neal, and Wells, thank you so much again for joining us this afternoon. Thanks also to my co-host, Frank Paul Tomasello from the Griffith Foundation. As always, this webinar will be archived and available on the CSG Knowledge Center and on the Griffith Foundation website. So if you missed any part of the program or would like to recommend it to a friend, it will be available soon. Be sure to check the CSG website for information about future eAcademy webinars and to check the Griffith Foundation website for information on risk management and insurance resources and programs as well. I'm Sean Sloan at CSG Headquarters in Lexington. Thank you for joining us.